am Barbara Martinez. I'm the Open Innovation Director at Conservation X Labs. And uh, welcome, welcome to um, our webinar. Um, by this point, I, all of you have probably watched The River of Gold. Um, and I am excited to, uh, to have our panelists here today to really do a deep dive into artisanal and small scale gold mining. Um, our goal here is to not only give you the opportunity to watch the fabulous film that was created by um, Sarah DuPont, one of our panelists here today, but also to um, use the film as a springboard um, for discussion about um, the issues of artisanal and small scale gold mining that, that may, um, you know, what are the opportunities as innovators, as potential applicants in the um, artisanal mining grand challenge? What are those opportunities for innovation? What, um, what questions do you have about the process, about the, the causes, the underlying drivers, the constraints? Um, what questions do you have that are going to help you create, um, uh, adapt or develop an innovation that could be um, applicable in the artisanal mining grand challenge? So that's our goal today is really to give you the opportunity to hear from um, a set of panelists and uh, do a deep dive into this topic. If you have questions after the discussion, um, that's also fine. Uh, you can just send them to send them to water at conservationxlabs.org, and we will try to address as many of your questions as we can. So, um, with that, I am going to do some brief introductions, and then we'll hear from each of the panelists, and we'll dive into some questions. So our, um, our first panelist is um, Dr. Luis E. Fernandez. He is the executive director at the Wake Forest University Center for Amazonian Scientific Innovation, CINCIA. And he is also an assistant professor of research at Wake Forest University's Department of Biology. Luis is an expert in the dynamics and impact of environmental mercury in the areas of artisanal mining. Um, our other panelist here is Daniel Stapper. He is the Senior Program Officer of PAT's Mines to Markets Program. Um, this program develops market-based approaches which support responsible mineral supply chains. And he is currently leading PAT's work to pilot and scale responsible mercury-free gold production in the artisanal and small-scale gold mining sector in several countries. Um, our final panelist is uh, Sarah DuPont. She is the founder and president of the Amazon Aid Foundation. She is also the producer and co-director of the film River of Gold, which, um, which all of you had the opportunity to watch online or perhaps in person in DC. Um, Sarah works with, uh, with a number of neotropical scientists to study the Amazonian biodiversity and especially with an eye towards educating the public and introducing cutting edge conservation practices on the ground to on the ground solutions in the region. So with that, um, I would like to um, hear from each, each panelist. Um, they're gonna give a brief introduction about themselves and a little bit of background about what types of, uh, the types of questions they hope to, to hear or, or answer. So um, uh, Sarah, why don't we start with you? Well, thank you very much. I'm excited to be on this panel and I'm happy to share the film with you all. I have been working in the Amazon for almost 20 years with some of the best tropical ecologists in the world. And um, what we do with that Amazon aid is we try to educate global audiences about the importance of the Amazon, the implications of, of its destruction and solutions for protecting it. So we have a lot of initiatives, including the River of Gold project, with, which is the film and curriculum and a big social media campaign. So I'm happy to answer uh, general questions about the Amazon. Um, I've also been working in the gold sector for about 10 years now, and it's very complex. Um, I'm probably not the expert here on this panel, so, but I'd be happy to answer any um, general questions and educational questions. and really excited about this Conservation X Labs project. So thank you for including me. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Daniel, why don't we hear from you? Sure. 
I'm happy to give a, a brief intro. Thank you, Barbara. Um, nice to be here with you all. Um, so I work with um, an international NGO called PACT. Um, and my first trip actually to the Amazon was in 2007, uh, specifically to take measurements of small scale gold mining, you know, the, the impacts and the effects. Um, and um, it's, it's a big challenge. And this is a really, really, I'm grateful to be part of the conversation here. Um, you know, PACT is a large international NGO. We're based in the US, but we're, we're all over the world in more than 30 countries um, with mining projects in, in about uh, 12 countries right now. Um, and so, you know, including in the Amazon, in, in Colombia, where we're working um, on, on the specific challenges around um, ASGM uh, with funding from the US government. Um, and and uh, the focus of our programs really depends on the, the specific context. Um, the film was great. I really enjoyed the film. Um, and, it, and obviously the, the sort of central you know, focus is the environmental um, degradation and, and the huge challenges that the artisanal and small scale mining um, presents to the, the forest ecosystem. Um, and it's gut wrenching um, as, as a biologist and, and an ecologist, it's, it's hard to see um, the forest being lost. On, on the other side, you know, there's a very human dimension to the issue. Um, and that's something that PACT, um, I would say has focused on more in our gold portfolio, um, but, but equally they, they go together. And you know, the human issue um, was also, I think highlighted very well in the film around minute 30, where you saw this mother talking about her lack of options um, and that, you know, that they're trying to pay for their education. Um, and so it's, it's a very complex issue. It's not just um, about, uh, you know, greed or, or miners that, are, that aren't interested, you know, um, in, in the environment. That's not it at all. It's, it's so, so we really need to take a nuanced view. Um, but in addition to our work in Colombia, um, I've also been brought on the panel because PACT is doing work um, on, on the same sector, but in other countries. Uh, in fact, I've just returned from, from Indonesia where we're working with the United Nations Development Program um, on, on a large intervention that's focused on mercury use in the small scale gold mining sector. And we see a lot of parallel issues. Um, we're working on in, in many countries in Africa as well, and I'd be happy to take questions on those projects or interventions. Um, and that is just uh, yeah, a brief intro from me. Thanks. Thank you, Luis. Let's hear um, an introduction from you. Sure. Hi. Good morning, everyone. I'm Luis Fernandez. Uh, I'm a tropical ecologist, and um, I study rainforests. That's what I do for a living. Um, and I came into the issue of artisanal gold mining because I was doing research in places like Brazil, uh, and found that there was a, a driver for deforestation that was not some of the the traditional ones, quote unquote like logging and agriculture. Um, there was something related to gold mining that started in the early 2000s and started to grow more and more. Um, so I kind of slipped into this, uh, you know, doing field studies and then seeing these huge areas that were uh, being transformed uh, virtually into deserts. Um, so it's something that really uh, concerned me, also interested me as a scientist to figure out what the, uh, the patterns, the drivers, and, and what's left over after mining. So started to focus on the deforestation and especially on the mercury uh, that's released by this. If you saw the movie, you saw that mercury is being used. So that has a tremendous impact, not just on the environment, but on the people that uh, eat the fish and the animals uh, that, that are in these rivers. And it's a river of gold. Uh, rivers are the lifeblood of the Amazon. So. Essentially, this is a, uh, something that is very different from, from logging or from agriculture or from other kinds of drivers that you see in the Amazon. Um, I've actually started to work in artisanal mining issues across the world in many countries in, in Latin America and Africa. We currently have projects in Peru uh, where we have a team of 25 dedicated individuals where we have a uh, research laboratory uh, right in the Amazon, uh, right in the middle of the, essentially the mining zone. It's called CINCIA, the Center for Amazonian Scientific Innovation, or Centro de Innovación Científica Amazonica, CINCIA. Um, and we're also doing work in Madagascar and in other areas uh, in Africa. Uh, and we hope to be uh, sharing a lot of the science and the methodologies for, uh, for, for understanding this with uh, essentially anybody who wants to use it. So the idea is to get 
more knowledge in this uh, and be able to describe it better because one of the things that's most uh, um, important to understand is that this is something relatively new. We don't know really what the long-term effects are both for public health but also on the environment side. We don't know how it's affecting these waterways, the animals that live in it, the birds that eat insects that come out of these rivers, um, the river otters. I mean, it's virtually not really, uh, there are not very many studies. We're doing some of the first science on this. So I'm very pleased to answer questions. I'm more on the science side, uh, but I will try to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. So my, my question, my first question to, um, to all of you is, is really what are some of the what are some of those um, barriers or, or constraints within um, artisanal and small-scale gold mining that, that could use innovation? Um, and so I, I know that there are a number of, of um, political constraints or um, social constraints perhaps, but if you could articulate what these are and, and you know, you don't have to really um, tell us what the solutions are necessarily, but but what is it that needs to be solved um, within artisanal and small-scale gold mining? And um, why don't I start with um, uh, Daniel? Would you like to uh, to take a stab at the question first? Sure, um, I'll take a stab at it. It's a really big question, as as I think all of the panelists will know. Um, so I'll take I'll take a little piece of it, um, and and I'll draw a little bit from from this work that I was just mentioning that, uh, that I've just returned from in Indonesia for almost a month. Um, and so the, the specific um, yeah, terms of that project, um, we're, we're trying to support the artisanal and small scale gold mining community with what we call the access to finance barrier. You know, so you, you asked the question, Barbara, as, as it relates to challenges. Um, we could also think about it as barriers. You know, what are the main things, I guess, holding, um, the artisanal and small-scale gold mining community back from a more responsible uh, supply chain, let's say. Um, and so one of them is the, the financial barriers, financial access. You know, how do they, how can we support them um, or how can they be, you know, empowered to support themselves to, to acquire, you know, mercury-free equipment, let's say, um, or as the case may be, just uh, business systems that allow them to organize in a more sustainable way. Um, and as we look at that barrier, as we look at that challenge, uh, we realize that it's really not, you can't look at it in isolation from the wider sort of um, formalization barrier, let's call it, um, which really requires, um, you know, a regulatory framework that works for relatively small scale, uh, artisanal and small scale gold miners. That's one of the really big challenges that we see. And I'm not sure, you know, the Conservation X challenge is really intended to, to support that challenge, but I think it's, it's kind of central to the, the challenge of supporting responsible gold mining. So I thought I'd bring it forward here first. Because um, of course they need permits. Um, that's one of the big challenges. Often they're interested or willing to get permits, but the process, usually the mining act is sort of designed with large scale mining, um, you know, uh, in, um, in mind, and so that's that's one of the big challenges is is not only working with mining communities to determine and to help capacitate them to develop systems so that they can operate in a legal way, um, but also working with government um, as, as PACT has been doing in a, in a few programs to try to make sure that those processes are actually streamlined based on the needs of this of this type of mining. You know what what does successful small scale gold mining look like? is a really important question to ask, I think, you know. In the context of, of the, the land use we see, you know, in the Amazon, especially around Madre de Dios, <clears throat> where you have these alluvial benches being mined, you know, the question ultimately does need to be asked from a regulatory standpoint, is this in any way acceptable from, you know, from a Mining Act perspective? Is, is it legalizable? Um, and the case may well be no, um, but that ultimately is a decision for, for lawmakers and regulators to do. Um, interesting to note on, on that subject, maybe I'm on a little tangent, but you know, mining in the Californian gold rush and in different parts of, of Alaska and the Yukon in Canada, um, we're also really fixated on these alluvial benches 
um, and in some cases still are. Um, and, and at a certain point, that now we're talking about more than 100 years ago when some of these gold rushes were at their height, the, the process of formalization did come along where they said at some point, dredging in the rivers is not allowed. Uh, and there was an enforcement mechanism that actually worked in that respect. Um, but similarly, some of these alluvial benches are still being mined um, in some of these areas. Um, and, and, you know, there's technology and processes to do it responsibly. So that's, that's further down the road. I mean, obviously, in the case of the Amazon, as we've seen in the video, um, they're nowhere near um, that perspective. So the, the challenge of financial barriers, the challenge of actually getting permits in order for banks to allow them to get loans, let's say, um, is, is, is really central to the challenge at hand. Let me just finally make a, a final comment back on the financial barriers piece. Um, it's been really interesting meeting with banks um, recently in Indonesia because there is great interest. There is an understanding that um, in, in many situations, these miners are making fairly good money. Um, and so the banks um, have an interest in you know, providing services to these miners. But almost ubiquitously, um, the miners are not being served by banks um, in these contexts. And there's several reasons for that. Um, the reasons are that you know, most of the miners don't have permits. Uh, most of the miners actually prefer to operate in a cash economy. And there's, there's you know, a lot of benefits for them to doing so. I, I won't go into too much detail, but, but you get the idea that um, to, to, um, to address these challenges, you really need to work from a systemic point of view. Um, you really need to work with local regulators. You really need to work on um, making sure that the different stakeholders in the local supply chain understand the challenges um, and, and determine you know, what is the will of the community? What is the will of the miners? Is there a way to, to come to some um, agreement as it relates to you know, what is, what is the, the local plan around mining? What is the land use plan around mining in, in a given community? It's, it's ch a challenge for everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Um, Luis, would you, would you like to, um, to respond? Sure. Uh, thanks very much. Well, I actually agree uh, entirely with Daniel. Much of this is financial barriers. Uh, in Madre de Dios, basically, we have a situation where the um, the permitting system, uh, or as it's known, their formalization process has been revamped essentially because for many years it wasn't working. Where uh, even though there's more than 10,000 uh, formal petitioners for for permits, only two were able to get them. Um, that pointed to a uh, system that was broken. Um, that was redone, and now there's more than uh, I think it's close to 200 that are going through. Um, also, it, it requires a fair amount of political will to be able to do the enforcement uh, and formalize or modernize this, this sector. Um, and this is something that at least in Peru has only really started um, this year with a major push by the uh, federal government uh, using all their ministries to not only increase enforcement, that's kind of the easy part, but make sure that the permitting system works and provide uh, essentially programs to um, provide al alternative economies for people that are currently illegal miners and putting them uh, to work in other sectors. Uh, people work in these areas mainly because uh, it is the land of opportunity. I live in San Francisco um, and the, you know, as living in a place that was essentially a gold mining town in the 1850s is the reason why San Francisco is, you know, basically exists because it's close to the gold fields in the mountains close by. Um, at some point there was a conversion from an illegal informal economy to a formal one and it can provide uh, a lot of wealth. But of course there is the environmental issue. So I'll talk for a couple of minutes about the environmental challenges. Um, essentially much of the, the damage that's created is because of very primitive te technology that's used by artisanal miners. They're essentially using technologies that are very similar to those not only used in the gold rush in the 1850s but those used by the Spanish. 500 years ago. Um, they're using high water, high pressure water hoses to blast out riverbanks and process it using mercury, which is a very uh, damaging uh, substance. It's very toxic. It contaminates entire watersheds and essentially the food supply for people that subsist on fish 
and and other products of the of the of the watershed. Um, but whether you use mercury or not, uh, because there are all, there are alternatives for using mercury for artisanal mining, including gravity separation, the use of what's called shaking tables, basically vibration tables to separate the gold from the sediments. You are still essentially scraping the rainforest off of the earth to be able to mine the sediments underneath those forests. So there's a lot of focus on whether or not you should use mercury or not. As a, as a forest ecologist, I'm concerned essentially by not only the mercury, but also the, the total loss of forests and the total loss of faunas, the, the animals that are inside those forests. So um, much has to be done with uh, figuring out where to do the activity and maintaining essentially the, the boundaries of where that happens. Um, in the case of much of the Amazon, this happens in protected areas, in, in and around national reserves, national parks, indigenous community reserves, that mining is not allowed and uh, it, that's where it becomes illegal. So it's, you know, one, we have to talk about the activity itself and the technology used that has to be modernized. But the other is where it, where, where it occurs. Um, even if you're using the best technology in the world, if you're chopping down a primary rainforest in a national park, that's not supposed to happen. That has a tremendous impacts. And that's essentially what's happening across the eight countries of the Amazon basin. Thanks, thanks Luis uh, and Daniel. So there are a couple of questions coming in about um, the extent of the um, extent of the deforestation that um, that could be linked to artisanal and small scale um, gold mining. So the questions are: Have have people quantified this um, loss? Um, is that information available? Um, and then a third. The third question is, um, what, have, what have governments or organizations done to rehabilitate um, these areas, uh, if, if anything? And, and maybe also comment on the scale of those rehabilitation efforts. Sure, sure. I, I can take a crack for that one. No. Okay. We, do, we do a fair amount of work on this. Um, so the first question was, uh, has the deforestation specifically from gold mining been quantified? Um, yes, in the Amazon there, there has been earlier in, let's see, December of uh, last year or January of this year, uh, there is a group uh, called RISGI, which is, um, I can pr uh, ask Barbara to post the uh, links to these maps, created a map. It's, it's a consortium of, uh, of spatial uh, experts that compiled uh, satellite imagery um, in 2017 and 2018 to figure out the extent of artisanal gold mining across the Amazon uh, and produced a very detailed map about where it occurs and it's basically its conflicts with native communities and protected areas. Um, and that was the first time that it was done on the continent scale. Um, uh, I'll, I'm sure that the, uh, it was covered by the New York Times, it was in the cover of the Washington Post, Manga Bay, so that was the first time that you saw the big picture. But many people have been working at smaller scales, trying to map where it is. Um, actually, in my research group, um, we uh, created a map of artisanal gold mining and uh, basically the deforestation created over 35 years, from 1985 to 2017 by analyzing um, high resolution satellite imagery every year that it was available and we quantified not only what's been lost today, but basically kind of the lifespan of mining and how it's grown and how it's linked with the price of gold. So when we plotted essentially that bar chart, you can imagine like little bars in 85 and it grows bigger and bigger. When we laid the, lay, the line of the price of gold, it tracked uh, almost perfectly. The correlation was extremely close um, and it gives you the, you know, the real picture in one graph, by the, when the price of gold goes up, you have deforestation from mining increasing, not just in Peru, but across the world, that relationship holds. Um, many other organizations have mapped this. Um, we actually created and published uh, in a scientific journal, a new methodology to specifically isolate mining because there's special characteristics 
So we have a really robust method of separating it from small scale agriculture or cattle ranching or logging. So we can now start to automate it. So what we're doing is we're creating uh, machine learning tools. We're using algorithms to automate the detection of this, uh, not just in the place where it works, but we can apply it across the Amazon and in Africa and Asia. Uh, once we uh, use essentially what's very similar to facial recognition uh, algorithms, basically using computers uh, to supercomputers to analyze where you see the mining equipment on a landscape. And that's a really good indicator of where, not just where the mining has occurred, but also where the mining will occur in the future. So there's, there's a lot of new technology, new innovation that's going into analyzing, uh, uh, detecting this. Uh, in terms of what happens afterwards, and whether or not gum, gum, uh, governments are doing something about it, um, I would say not enough. Um, the challenge really is not just that you have an area that has no trees. It's an area that's mined. It's very similar, it's a strip mine essentially. It's a, it's a complete loss of all the soils and much of the, the mineral soils underneath it and that could go down five, 10, 20 meters um, and it's surface. So basically they're scraping it and then processing the first 30 to 40 feet um, 10 meters, 20, you know, 10 to 15 meters, sometimes deeper. Um, and there you have, you have basically, it's not even soil, it's basically just sand and cobbles and, and gravel. So that doesn't have a lot of nutri you know, nutrients, it doesn't have any carbon to be able to provide the ability to absorb water or to retain nutrients. So you really have to do several things. You have to build back the soils and you have to um, select native species um, that can withstand essentially being transplanted in the middle of the desert. And this was a rainforest before. Um, you know, there are trees that you could plant that will grow in that kind of climate, but that's not, they're not rainforest trees. Essentially, you're getting these invasive species and putting them in an area that was, it was supposed to be a rainforest. So, um, I personally have a problem with that. You're, you know, if it's a rainforest, you want to bring back the rainforest, at least try to accelerate it. So there's been a lot of work done with native species, figuring out which are the pioneers that can go in there and then create conditions to help them reestablish the forests. And then mix in species that will be the big climax, the species like you saw the Brazil nut tree that the Goody liked. You have to throw some of those in the mix. They grow slower, so by the time the fast growing trees reestablish, they'll have some shade and those slow growing climax trees will, will have a chance at reestablishing the forest. Because once you reestablish the forest, then you can hope that the animals will come back. And again, this is something when people talk about reforestation, you know, we're not building tree parks. We want forests that have animals in them um, because that's, that's what they're supposed to have. Also, native people require non-forest timber products and, and animals to hunt if they're still living traditionally. So, um, you need to use the native species from the region to reforest areas to restore, restore the, the animal to life back into that forest. Um, and just to finish up, again, there needs to be a lot more work. Um, we, we've worked on essentially reforestation methods where we basically do lots of experiments figuring out what species work and where and how to create situations to bring back that soil using uh, technologies like biochar, which is a special kind of charcoal um, special planting methods that make it more probable and the use of like high-tech nurseries so they that you can produce you know the millions of trees that you need to reforest you know a hundred thousand hectares that have been disforested for example. Thank, thank you Luis. Um, Daniel I noticed that you were um, posting some links in the chat would you like to um, address the question and, and what you've posted? Uh, sure. Uh, that, thank you, Louis. That was a great intervention. And um, I just threw some links there for the panelists and the attendees um, of those uh, mm, Amazon mining uh, mapping uh, groups that, uh, that Louis was mentioning, because I was also looking at those uh, just in preparation for this. Um, and uh, both of those resources are, are really good ones, um, different groups of researchers. Um, that are that are making maps public um, and looking also that the, at the drivers of the reforestation uh, and trying to separate out as as we was also mentioning that his group is doing the mining uh, from the other sources of deforestation. So there's a lot of really great maps there. 
Um, and it's really worth mentioning, you know, this, um, this type uh, of effect, I think, before I go into to a, a bit um, uh, of a different tangent, um, that this type of, of mining where they need to tear all the trees down is really the result of this certain type of gold deposit. And, and as I understand it, the Conservation X challenge is not reserved sort of for the Amazon. It's not geographically reserved. That's correct, isn't it? Right, correct. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, this this type of alluvial deposit where the, the, the Amazon forest is getting um, really mowed down to access this kind of, uh, you know, gold in the gravels below the rainforest um, is just one of the types of gold deposits um, and uh, is really prevalent in the Amazon. Less prevalent in the Amazon is the... Um, is the hard rock mining, although in other parts of the Amazon, actually, um, it, it is sort of the the more typical um, hard rock uh, mines that you see. Um, parts of Colombia, um, you see a lot of hard rock mining, um, and that's that's what we see in many other countries as well, where we don't have the same type of ancient alluvial benches. Um, all that gold in the cobbles below the rainforest is actually the result of um, over geological time, over hundreds of thousands of years, of course, there's rivers moving. So that's secondary gold deposit that was initially coming down from the mountains or the hard rock as it weathered um, and getting deposited in the gravels of these rivers. And over geological time, rivers move, you know, hundreds of kilometers um, east to west, uh, north to south. And so you have um, this ancient alluvial gold stuck in these alluvial benches that are now covered with rainforest soils. Um, and that's what the miners are going after. Um, so it's quite different from the hard rock context where the impact on an environmental scale is quite a bit different. But interestingly, um, you still have the, the quite intensive, in many cases, use of mercury because they bring that rock out of you know, the shaft, let's say, and they crush the rock. In some cases, including in the Amazon, uh, they add uh, an awful lot of mercury, even more mercury to this type of rock because they actually add mercury to the entire ore as they crush it. Um, and that's not ubiquitous in the Amazon, but it is also very typical there. Um, and, uh, and that's one of the, if we're focused on the mercury challenge, which, you know, to your earlier question is one of the, the things that I think, uh, you know, Conservation X is also looking for solutions around is really we should focus on those operations where they're using an awful lot of mercury. Um, and that's what we call whole ore amalgamation, where they're literally putting mercury in, in volumes in order to, to process the entire ore, so all of this hard rock. And of course, all of the, most of that mercury that they're, they're adding it gets, gets cooked after, after they form an amalgam, um, which is then, you know, the, the mercury acts like a glue for the gold. Um, and so then they have the mercury with gold inside it. They want only the gold, so they heat it, they cook it, uh, and it burns off the mercury as fumes to leave the gold behind, uh, which then can be sold on into the, into the supply chain to the traders. And, and so mo most of that mercury goes up in smoke, uh, you know, and the fate of that mercury is, is, uh, is being studied by a lot of researchers. A lot of it is deposited locally based on weather patterns. Um, a lot of it gets deposited, you know, in the rainforest and, and in the community around. And so there's a lot of acute health, you know, concerns, of course, for the immediate community. But as Louis was also mentioning um, and, and was mentioned in the film, you have this really, um, you know, serious concern around the local food chain, around local fish. Um, if, if the mercury effluent from these operations is going into the streams, um, uh, and, and it's worth mentioning, I guess, that we have this large international convention, the Minamata Convention, uh, which is specifically targeting mercury. And so we actually have, um, you know, and it, I think this, this new convention, international convention, it's a UN convention, uh, more than 150 countries have signed to it. Um, it's a really important opportunity, you know, and for Conservation X Challenge to, to engage with uh, all the organizations focused on solutions for, for the Mercury Challenge. Um, I, I'm also really passionate about the, the reforestation piece. And so in the context of, you know, the film and, and this big issue of the Amazon, you know, being um, destroyed, it's really a, an interesting challenge. And before I go on to the Mercury abatement, I'll say a few words quickly just about that, um, but, but Louis has covered it very well already. Um, in fact, in my university days in Canada, I was very involved in tree planting. Um, and so I also have some knowledge of the silviculture industry in Canada. And it did go through a, a big, you know, a process of maturation and transformation um, where it used to be that sil the, the forestry companies were literally 
planting a monocrop, um, uh, you know, uh, just farming the trees essentially. And that is still the case in some areas, but in other areas they're, they're doing more to try to reforest in, in an ecologically sensitive way. So you have, you know, maybe four different species uh, as a tree planter on you at any time and you, you need to really select the microsite for those species. Um, and as Louis was saying, it's succession, um, which means, you know, starting with species that will grow in, in this degraded climate is, is critical because, especially because, as, as Louis was saying, you know, you, you're losing this, the very top of the soil horizon, which is really in the rainforest, the most critical one, where a lot of nutrients and organics are stored. And so um, I think, actually, personally, that I've been thinking about this, even when I was recently in Indonesia, that the Conservation X Challenge may be, may be really well suited to, to some pilot project focused on um, exactly this challenge of how can we um, ensure that new species are able to take up? What, how, what are the conditions we need to set up? Obviously, one of the really biggest challenges is erosion in this, in this sandy soil. Um, and the rains, when they come in these climates, they come hard. And so um, the, there's no, no uh, organic matrix for the, the young plants to, to hold on to. And so, you know, we have to think about what are the actual, um, what are the, the reforestation challenges we can, we can find technical solutions for? I think that's a really exciting opportunity for the Conservation X Challenge and, and applicants um, in, in, their, in, their, um, in their ideas. Um, as for, for uh, mercury abatement, um, maybe I'll, I'll quickly talk that. You know, one of the, the major alternatives which is being taken up all over the world um, is also the major chemical that large-scale mining companies use, and that's cyanide. Um, and now cyanide is, is a very toxic chemical as well. Uh, it's toxic in a different way than mercury is. Um, but if used responsibly, um, it can in fact be quite, um, you know, um, environmentally um, manageable, let's say. It's essentially a carbon and, uh, carbon and nitrogen atom, but with a unique sort of triple bond. Um, but it has unique properties for that reason, uh, the, the cyanide atom, um, or cyanide molecule, I should say. Um, in any case, the important thing, again, as, as it is with the financial and the formalization barrier, is how the question is how can we support artisanal miners to use these new methods responsibly? You know, in addition to cyanide, um, there's other leeches. Um, a lot of groups have been you know, hoping for or looking for maybe a miracle chemical that was um, you know, environmentally benign um, and then could com completely eliminate the use of mercury. And, and that, that has not been found. Um, you know, there's, there's certain leeches uh, which can work, but they usually work in very sort of specific conditions, you know. Um, hydrogen peroxide in some cases can work, uh, hypochlorite, uh, sodium nitrate, um, but in, in various chemical combinations, and really ultimately those other solutions typically require a lot more technical knowledge. The reason mercury is so ubiquitous um, uh, in the small-scale gold mining sector all around the world is because it's so easy and so quick and ultimately incredibly affordable. Even now with the new minimatic convention, we see the, the price of, of mercury increasing as a result of trade uh, constricting around the world. So now a kilogram of mercury um, costs between one and $200, depending on where you are in the supply chain. Usually for miners, it's closer around the $200 um, per kilo. But they're not buying a kilo, they're buying like, you know, 15, 20, 100, rather 100 grams. It's really dense. So even a, a bottle cap is, is about 100 grams. Um, but, but the point is, you know, that one kilo that costs them, you know, around $200 um, is enough mercury for them to produce around 20,000 US dollars worth of gold. Um, so it's, you know, mercury, yeah, it's a cost, it's a concern, but it's like 2% of their costs in terms of like the gold they're producing. So, so ultimately, uh, it's cheap. It's quick uh, and it's super easy. It takes them 15 minutes at the end of the day to process the gold and really get it out of, of the sediment using mercury. That's it's a really major challenge and, and it's difficult to contend with. Um, so ultimately, what's needed, and this is ultimately a call for you know conservation X um, applications, is and this is something we've also been working on at PACT is systems which is essentially a, a biz, it needs to be a business model. It needs to work for the artisanal mining community such that you know, if it's a heavy mineral concentrate at the end of the day, um, that they have a way to you know, responsibly, safely deal with, um, deal with uh, getting the gold out in a way that's economical. Because if there's no ec economy for them, if it's, if it's not an 
incentivized in some way um, and can't, you know, can't do what Mercury does for them, it's very difficult to, to support the behavior change that's required. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Thank you brought up a lot of really um, important points there. Um, <clears throat> What I wanted to, uh, we have a couple of questions about the film itself, and so, um, so, so Sarah, a, a question came up about um, how come there weren't any um, authorities, uh, police um, interviewed in the film or or brought into part of the um, the narrative, and so it's it's an interesting question too to think about. Um, uh, to also. Um, to, you know, I'll, I'll ask I'll ask you Sarah about that question, but I think also Luis and, and Daniel to um, to articulate um, the difference here between uh, the that gold mining in some areas is illegal in some areas it's it's legal. Um, last night when we filmed when we screened this film in a theater in DC, um, the the point was brought up that illicit activities are different from from illegal activities. And so, um, Sarah, why don't you comment on that aspect of the film, and then um, I'll turn it to uh, Luis and Daniel to comment a bit on, on the, um, the, the gradient, I guess, of, of artisanal and small-scale gold mining and, and formalization, um, illegality, legality. Well, first of all, thanks, Luis and Daniel. You guys are you know, great at your work. But I, I think that, if I may, just before I get into that, I think that it's really important to not only discuss the challenge on the ground, but getting the gold to market and the blockchain, the, the, site, the, the chain of uh, su supply chain to get the gold to the refineries. And that's extremely problematic and complex. There is a lot of illicit activities that are happening uh, after it leaves the ground. And for instance, a lot of uh, the gold is probably being, you know, the illegal gold is being washed in Dubai, et cetera. So I think for this challenge, you know, it needs to be looked at as the whole system. And it's hugely, you know, on the ground is, is really complex and difficult, but it has to be, I, in my opinion, you, you, it needs to be looked at from top down and bottom up because it's, it is a whole system. And as again, the illicit, a lot of the illicit activities are not only in the ground, but they're, they're in the supply chain. And so the goal is to, to promote an accountable, transparent supply chain for gold. And, um, and that will push for the responsible, responsibly mine gold. So I think it needs to come be looked at from bottom down, top up. Um, as far as um, interviewing the police, that's, that's a great idea. I wish we would have. But where we were in the film, actually inside the camps, it was extremely dangerous. And the uh, police, if they were nearby, they were also ex very corrupt. In fact, while we were there, the only people that would take us in were the, were the uh, people that got the child slaves out of the camps. They were, uh, no one else would take us inside because it was so dangerous. And while we were there, there was a bus load of kids that had been taken from the Andes and their parents thought those kids were going to become uh, work in Lima some nice place but they ended up being taken into Mamba de Dios and um, the kid the, this couple got these kids and rescued them and they could not take them to the police because they would put them right back in the system so it's incredibly corrupt and it's extremely dangerous so I even think um, interviewing the police would probably be could be dangerous well for what we were doing then um louise could probably for louise probably knows more about the police and how they work now on the ground so but it's a great idea so um i can certainly talk about that because um we um we work with the police now and we work with the military uh, so when Sarah went down in 20, uh, in 2010 and, and, and earlier times, it was still very much an undercover, uh, illicit, illegal, lots of names for it, uh, activity um, that wasn't really uh, taken care of by the, by the authorities. So it was something that was left alone for a long time. Um, as I mentioned, we, we were looking at it going back in the street in uh, 1985. 
So this is not something that just popped up you know, in the last couple of years, but it's been growing and it wasn't really being uh, looked at as an environmental problem or a social problem uh, until it became one. So um, it, it, you know, it was very difficult when I started working there in 2007, it was a place where mining was thought to be normal, that people had mercury in little bottles in their house or in their back pocket. Um, and most people didn't even think that mercury was toxic. Um, there was a lot of kind of misinformation uh, by people saying, well, you know, it's not really toxic. It's, it must be some story um, that uh, people are just saying just to scare us because they don't want us to mine. Um, so uh, it was a very unusual space, but now things are different. Um, a lot because of a lot of uh, uh, information about what's happening. Also a lot of science uh, and information that's being directed at, at, at children uh, in schools that, that talk about health problems related to this. Also awareness of what's happening in forests because most city people don't really know what's going on outside. Um, and also that the government has taken this on as, as a fact. Um, so uh, just, uh, there's been two states of emergencies in the last three years, one on mercury and the other on just uh, illegal gold mining. Um, part of it is essentially to modernize the, the, and formalize the system. Like may, if they're going to do mining, then it needs to comply, they need to pay taxes, they need to have permits, and they need to have, you know, technologies which are, which are allowed. Um, so uh, in February 2019, the government uh, essentially started a major operation. They went into the protected areas and they uh, took out all the miners. Um, and then now they've established uh, two military bases and one um, police base inside the mining zone to essentially prevent you know, illegal miners from going back uh, with a series of other actions like reforestation and in some cases remediation of sites that may have been contaminated and a big environmental campaign. So uh, things have changed. When we talk to the police, they're not only tolerant, they're aware of that they have a mandate to, to do this. Um, you know, that, uh, that is something that we haven't seen before. And this is happening in many places around the world where this is seen as, a, uh, as an important uh, aspect of environmental protection. Um, and we, uh, Hope that this continues, of course, hand in hand with providing the tools for people to take advantage of the natural resources that they have, like gold. Mining is something that is important for the world, both as a, I guess, a jewelry object, but also because of its use in electronics. Um, a lot of stories recently focused on the fact that your cell phones use gold and your all your special devices use gold. So it's not just for rings and, and jewelry. Um, but it's something that uh, is, you know, responsible mining. Um, so responsible uh, sourcing for gold and responsible jewelry uh, has to be uh, a priority, just like, you know, organic coffee and uh, where you ask where your wood comes from. It doesn't, it's not chopped down from a forest that's uh, in a park. So uh, a lot of it, as Sarah, you know, had mentioned, has to include the, not just a kind of, in improving the engineering aspect of it, but the, the, the demand side, like who's buying it? Are they saying, I want to have some, I want to have a product. I want to have gold that comes uh, from a mine that's, that acts responsibly, both socially, uh, but also environmentally, and then uh, and willing to pay a little bit extra for it. Kind of like the way that we do now with milk and eggs and coffee, you know, we pay a little extra for our organic, uh, Thing. And also, uh, in one of the commodities that we do, blood, um, you know, diamonds, um, they've used the term blood diamonds essentially because it was linked to civil wars in Africa uh, and a lot of uh, bad things happening because of that. Um, now, we don't, we don't have so, many, so much of that. We hope that there's something similar with things related to gold as well in many parts of the world. Thanks, Luis. Uh, so we just have a, a few minutes um, left here on the webinar, and I want to make sure that each of the panelists has an opportunity to end on um, what they would like to, to see come out of the, the challenge. Um, you know, if it's, you know, I'm not looking for you to describe that specific solution, but, um, but what is it that, that you hope to uh, yeah, what is it that you hope that this grand challenge will achieve? 
um, in addressing uh, artisanal and small scale gold mining. And i um, just gonna give each of you a couple of minutes and then I wanna end on some more of uh, general, there's, there've been some questions coming through about um, what's acceptable in the challenge and what, what's the scope of the challenge. So I wanna make sure that I can cover that in, in the last couple of minutes. So um, Sarah, why don't we start with, with you? Okay, well, I think it's really important to formalize the, the sector and bring better technologies and um, funding. So there's better working conditions, mercury free, that the miners actually stay within their mining zones where there's gold and um, they look at the Amazon as a system and figure out where it's best to do that. I also think it's really important to look at the supply chain and how to certify the gold and get it to markets. And, try, and, and if you do that, then there's gonna, a lot of the illicit activity will still be there, but it'll certainly help all that part of it. Um, and it's really important as consumers for everyone to um, know where their gold comes from and push for responsible gold all the way up from the ground to the, to the refineries and the consumer. So thank you all. It, this is a very complex problem and um, I'm really excited that Conservation Access is uh, having this challenge and I can't wait to see what you all come up with. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Luis? Sure. Um, so what I what do I want out of this challenge? So um, what I'm what I'm hoping for is that there is um, something that moves the needle. So one of the reasons why I was so excited about the challenge is because this is a very as as we keep on saying over and over again, this is a complex problem. It's a complex problem, um, and it really is because it links essentially the will of consumers in rich nations with the decision making on a day to day basis by uh, people very far away, in mainly in developing countries in uh, in rainforests or on the top of mountains on uh, deciding whether or not they should continue to be a gold miner that day. Um, and that in means that there's a lot of moving parts. That's a tremendous value chain and there's lots of technology. So it's not just well, you know, what machine that they use, but also how is it brought to market? How is it refined? How is it transported to places like Dubai and Switzerland? How is it converted into uh, with, with all its attributes of, of information where it came from, whether it was responsibly mined um, and converted into the forms that we see it in our malls or uh, when it gets sent to a factory in China for your iPhone. Um, that's a big problem. And you know, you can think of it in, in three blocks maybe. So one is, you know, what's the, what's the machines and what's the systems that are used for getting it out of the ground and taking it to a form that then you're, you're, you're taking out, out of that kind of mining zone or that mining economy. Right? What would happen in a place like Peru or Tanzania or Madagascar or, or Indonesia? And then how it gets transformed into an object of value, which is the results chain, like the financial system. I would like to see innovations on how you do the traceability and tracking. Things like blockchain get a lot of press as kind of the solution to everything. Um, I still am not too sure what blockchain is, um, but uh, it sounds exciting, but there are, you know, ways of, you know, adding the value to, to have basically that, that, that characteristic that says this piece of gold was responsibly mined and have it traced all the way to the consumer. Um, I think there's innovations in making, in awareness building and making people understand why this is an important issue um, and what the impacts are for their decision making when you go and they, you want to buy uh, you know, a piece of jewelry for your sweetheart. Um, and, and then also, um, how do we use the newest cutting edge, cutting edge technologies? All the things that we have in our iPhones with facial recognition and, and all this kind of amazing technology that we have essentially for playing games and talking to each other on our phones can be leveraged for important questions and important issues like uh, gold mining, artisanal gold mining and its impact on rainforest areas around the world uh, and the people that live in them. So I would like to see tech transfer from the things that we see every day that amaze us into problems that have been around for decades or centuries. I think that's a better use of our time and our technology. So that's what I hope for. Thanks, Louise. Um, 
Daniel, you want to take a, a minute to um, to address this question as well? Definitely. Yeah, we're, we're getting uh, short on time. Um, I, I'm also equally excited about technical solutions. Um, you know, we've talked about, looked at mapping, uh, mercury-free technology solutions, uh, blockchain solutions perhaps, but traceability, how can we support miners to ensure that you know, they're rewarded for their extra effort, let's say. Um, and that's that's a really key challenge. You know, a lot of different organizations, including, you know, the big refineries, the London Bullion Market Exchange, uh, you know, the, uh, the Jewelry Council, um, they have standards. But the question is, okay, well, how can we support artisanal mining communities to actually accomplish those standards? And that's really a, a tricky um, challenge that I think needs to be central in our thinking. As great as these technological solutions may be, and I do think they, they warrant attention and investment, I would I would like to just return to this this you know a really important piece in, in in my opinion and from my experience working with with artisanal mining, that you know relationships with miners it really needs to form the basis of a successful intervention, um, uh, because you know, for example, some development projects have, have piloted in, you know, um, let's say an American into a remote rainforest uh, to be to be the guy who's, um, you know, building a gold refinery in a remote place um, in order to get that gold to the international market. That is a type of solution, but I'm not sure it's the system solution that, that is really needed. Um, um, so, so these kind of system solutions based on relationships, based on working with local government, um, that can then uh, achieve some scale because the system is 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 improving you know as our systems did um in in north american uh, gold history you know when when formal systems came in and started to regulate um what was and what was not permissible in our rivers for example um that's what i'd like to see thank you so just um to conclude the uh to conclude our our um discussion today um, I wanted to just go into a little bit of detail about the Artisanal Mining Grand Challenge. Um, and for those of you who submitted questions and we weren't able to get to them, um, we will, um, we're creating a frequently asked questions document for the webpage and um, we can, uh, we'll try to answer all of your questions and perhaps respond to you directly and then um, include those responses um, on our website as well. So the, the Artisanal uh, mining grand challenge the scope of it is um, is you know it's global in scope and it's it's addressing anything that is mined through artisanal or small-scale mining today we had a discussion about gold mining but this covers um, everything that's mined through um, through ASM through artisanal small-scale mining the three sub challenge sub challenges the three categories of the competition include the first one is prevent, remediate, restore. So we're looking for innovations and solutions that are going to prevent, remediate, or restore um, uh, land, water, hydrology, biodiversity, human health, ecosystems. What innovations have worked? Um, how might these scale beyond the current pilot um, projects or, or, you know, if you have if you have a system, if you have innovations that are working at a small scale, what is it going to take to get you to to grow that innovation to um, move it beyond a pilot um, a pilot study? So there was a question here about site specific solutions being considered in the challenge. Absolutely, um, but as you dig into the application and work on your um, work on presenting your your innovation to the reviewers and judges. Um, Consider, uh, you know, tell us about what what are those barriers to in order to um, scale that innovation or that project. Um, what is it that is needed to go beyond um, a single site? Like, how are you going to to replicate this in multiple sites? Um, the second sub challenge here in the uh, in the competition is called reform the supply chain, and so this is really addressing innovations that could occur at any point along the value chain or supply chain of these mined commodities. That first area, prevent, remediate, restore, is really focusing on um, uh, site um, innovations that are going to be applied at, at the site where materials are extracted. 
um, the reform the supply chain, think about solutions that would occur at any point along that value chain, all the way downstream to the consumer, the manufacturer, the brands that are using these materials. And finally, the last category is called the global data challenge. And this sub challenge seeks innovations that um, can measure environmental and social impacts of artisanal and small scale mining, but also equip people with the tools that so that they could use this data, utilize this data for better decision making um, that can improve the environmental and social outcomes of artisanal and small scale mining. And I'm going to plug the um, Delve database and the Delve report, which we have a link to this um, on our mining, uh, on the challenge website. But um, that particular report has outlined what some of those data gaps are and um, is really acting as a repository for information data collected in um, that is related to artisanal and small scale mining. Um, finally, what I want to highlight is that the right now the prize pool, so that total amount of money that we're giving away in this competition is $750,000. 100,000 of that is, um, is the Microsoft award. And so this is innovation, an innovation that utilizes um, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning or machine learning in its um, design and application. Uh, so that I just want to highlight that there is also that opportunity. Um, your innovation could fall into any of those three sub challenges and be um, eligible for the Microsoft money. As you go through the application for this, you will notice that you can select if you're eligible for the Microsoft um, award. Um, we're going to have uh, future webinars that will go into more detail about the challenge and the process of applying, and we'll also have um, additional topical webinars as well. Um, again, thank you everyone for joining. Um, we did record this, and so we will um, provide this to people who, who couldn't make it in real time. And thank you again, everyone.